Welcome, Dr. Lightman, and thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to start with vandalism and what is it? How does it affect us? Well, vandalism can occur at many dimensions. With physical dimension, we know about that. But there could be vandalism at a psychological dimension, where uh, we are critical, contemptuous, um, uh, talk about put-downs to people. Uh, we are diminish their sense of confidence about the quality of their life or skills. That's a form of vandalism. And we're used to that being uh, presented as unkind words, gestures, you know, scowl, that sort of thing. But there was, any time we speak, any time we uh, have a intense thought, we generate the energy of our attitude, the energy of our convictions, and that's radiated, almost like a, the equivalent of a psychological breath. And it moves into your energy field, and depending on what it is, it can lift you up or tear you down. Most common thing that we see is uh, we're people who are really affectionate, mothers to children, they radiate their affection to the child. That's, that's a projection of psychological energy. But more commonly, the problem comes with psychic vandalism is around people who they don't say too much, but they scowl at us, they secretly think we're stupid, or uh, um, our talents are absurd, our convictions are dumb. And if you're around people like that very often, uh, after a few minutes you can sense, unless you're as dense of a stick of wood, you can sense they don't like me, they don't approve of me. Uh, there's something they find inferior about me. And <clears throat> we usually we can fluff that off because uh, it's like, well, I know me better than they do and I prefer my opinion better than they do. Uh, so that's it, that's the end of it. But in certain people who are sensitive, people who are insecure, children, people who are very sick, they're very vulnerable to psychic vandalism. Mm -hmm. That eventually wears down our self-esteem. It wears down our confidence. It wears down our ability to think clearly. And some people are better that than others. They, um, these are the human sharks and barracudas. They've gone to charm school. They know the right gestures. They know uh, the soft voice, what I call the undertaker voice. Oh, everything's all right. Oh, I'm so sorry. They, they learn the mannerisms, but inside, they're thinking something quite else. And particularly if there's a sense of rivalry, uh, where they um, uh, feel some competition from you, you threaten their authority, then they ramp it up. <clears throat> and a strong person can take that for a while, <clears throat> but a weaker person or someone who is just naive, think that, well, everyone likes me, I'm an okay person, they begin to feel the mood beginning to slip. They begin to feel um, something must be wrong with me. I don't know what it is. And the initial response is to become introverted, to think something must be wrong, I, must, I don't know about, I'm, I'm missing something, I must be doing something that's offensive. And then we, we tear ourselves down. So first there's the, the attack, the assault, and then we tear ourselves down. We begin to think, there's something wrong with me, that person doesn't like me, I don't, I must be, I'm missing something. And so psychic vandalism goes from projection from outside to triggering our own self-doubts, our own um, self-criticism. So if we're, many people are not aware of energies being transmitted. So we're immediately going to assume it's us, there's something wrong with us. Right. And the more aware or the more we examine ourselves, the more we might become um, aware of what's happening. How do we become aware if of this vandalism of how energies are affecting us? Well, it's a subtle thing and it's easy to get paranoid here and overdiagnose this. <clears throat> Sometimes it's just, it is us, we're just in a bad mood. We you know, got out of the bed the wrong way or something, I don't know. But what you notice eventually is in certain situations, I feel very different and uncomfortable when I'm around this person or this group, or uh, sometimes I have to go visit a hospital and see someone there. and. Hospital is not full of happy people. Uh, they're <laughs> full of sick people who are tired, who are afraid, relatives who are frightened and depressed. And after a few, like an hour in a hospital, it, even for me, it begins to build up. I sense you feel you feel it in the hospital yeah. a lot. And the worst would be a nursing home where there are people, more people are depressed. But th sometimes you visit a place or you visit with a person, and after a few minutes, there's an alteration of your mood, your energy, your outlook. 
Uh, and after you leave, it kind of goes with you. There's a feeling of irritability for some. Some people get a headache. Uh, some people are just, um, feel like they're coming down with the flu. There's a kind of a vague malaise or achiness. And you realize when it happens repeatedly, there's a pattern that around this person, this group, or this place, I feel differently. I don't feel good. You're probably being vandalized by the, 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 the people who are there or the energies that are, are there. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's nothing personal, it's just the place is sick. The hospital is sick, full of sick people, or the nursing home is. Occasionally it's an office. You could just sometimes walk into a certain office and there's really intense tension and competition. It's like the knives are out. <laughs> They're not aimed at you, it's just at the atmosphere. Or sometimes I've gone into a church <clears throat> and <laughs> I feel headachy and nauseated within you know, 15 minutes. Something, something unchristian is going on there. <laughs> so how, well, okay, first of all, you also mentioned that some people move into a home and they get sick. It, is spraying sage or doing blessings, what would you recommend for environments? Because environments are different than, you know, one-on-one. Right. -on -one. Yes, it's true. There are some people I know that move into a home that, where someone else has been there and they, they were quite sick or died there. Um, and energy, the house is saturated with, um, depression, fatigue, despair, pessimism. Anyway, to clean it out, um, if you can, you like to uh, repaint the place, uh, change the furniture, get rid of what you can get rid of. Uh, I tell some people, if you, you know, paint the walls, before you paint the walls, you take the paint a can and you pray over it and bless it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. You, you can um, use lots of incense. Uh, you can play uh, what you would consider happy, good music, uplifting music. I prefer classical things like Bach, uh, but it takes a while. You have to give yourself a few weeks to really change the energies of the place. The most powerful thing to do is just keep blessing it. Uh, just keep blessing it. This is my home. This is my haven. This is my nest. Uh, this is where I rest and restore myself. And I want it. I, I pray that God's grace and peace and order will be here. And after a while, it goes away. Usually. For really bad cases, it takes up to a year, but usually within a few wow. weeks, you can change a lot. I like that. So it's taking, and we're going to talk about how you own protecting ourselves, but it's actually taking ownership and responsibility in changing the energy of the environment. Right. But if someone's in a hospital, I mean, what's the best thing to do? I mean, do you believe in the saging or the incense? At least that's something, right? You can do that. The hospitals probably would prefer you not to do that. But right, at, that's at right. You can do it. But in a hospital, it's, um, you can still do a blessing. You can, it, around hospitals, there, there are mixed energies. But there are always some good energies in the back. There's kind of little healing angels over here sometimes. You can invoke them. They give special attention to this room and this person here. Sometimes that helps. I really believe very powerfully in the use of prayer to invoke positive energies for people. And as I've seen at work, it's just, it's not a matter of, well, this is the dog, well, so we'll do this. It's a case I've seen at work many times where it can be very helpful. The big thing is sometimes after you cleanse things, people, <laughs> it's like if you clean house, gee, within a couple weeks, it's dusty again, <laughs> or faster than that. Uh, we, can, we can bless a hospital room or a nursing home room, but the person itself will call it back. It can call back the despair, the worry, the, the confusion, and so forth. They have to be primed to be constructive, too, to support. They have to participate. Yes. So when we talk about negative energies, okay, some people will conjure up like devils and demons. What we're talking about is personality traits of, of blame, of fear. Right. Are there, but are there actual, like, demonic energies? Well, there are. That's overstated a bit too much. But uh, the most demonic energies come from, they are the thought forms. Uh, people who are just hateful and crazy and zealous and, and very indignant. You sometimes see that in politics. You sometimes see that in Bible-banging evangelists that really are worked up and very angry and very excited. They put a lot of emotions into their beliefs. They put a lot of emotions into condemning this evil here, or condemning this politician, or whatever. That's, that's where the demons come from, from angry people. Uh, they are the thought forms of, uh, of human, humans. And as such, they can be quite powerful. 
uh, I sometimes, because of my work, get uh, resent, resented by certain fundamentalist Christians and others. And it's not pleasant, because you get just like a, in my book I call it like throwing rocks at the psychic level, and knives, and sometimes hand grenades. It, it, it just blasts you, sometimes it's forceful, I feel like you hit on the head. And it can scramble your thinking, get you a bit confused for a while. It can be very unpleasant, something very foreign to where I am. So you know when you're being hit? Usually. Mm -hmm. You do, and what you do then is you just, can we talk about how you resource, you know, what, what do you do to pull yourself back together? Well, you have to have a strong, uh, positive concept of who you are, a very positive world outlook. Uh, that, that's the basic thing, the fundamentals. If you really believe that um, I know who I am, I like myself, I know I have some problems, but I'm dealing with that. I basically like my life, what I'm doing. I think the world is full of abundance of good people. There's some bad people here and there, but that's okay. We have to share the world with idiots and nasty people and dishonest people and stupid people. That's, that's all right, as long as we can handle ourselves. So it's a matter of have, starting with a very confident attitude and conviction about I'm okay, my world is safe, but there are some bad things around there. Then the other is to be uh, quite detached. I'm aware so-and-so doesn't like me. I'm aware so-and-so is threatened by my ideas. And that's okay. But they'll, they'll eventually learn. I'm not, I'm not worried about trying to convert them. I don't react to them as an enemy. I react to them as someone who's just a disbeliever. They're a bit confused. They don't understand yet. And eventually when they do, they'll, they'll like me and they'll like my ideas. So the important thing is not to react with anger, not to react with fear. Because when you do, then it's like you open the door, psychically, for them to pour their animosity into you. So you have to be very calm. It's like being around dogs that seem to be dangerous. You don't want to say, oh my God, that dog's going to bite me. <clears throat> you have to realize, that's a nice doggy. <laughs> and I'll be very quiet. I won't radiate fear back. So that, that, that would magnetically pull them into me. So you have to be very calm, very focused, very positive, very quiet. And usually you can just get by. If, if, but it's worse than that, then you have to um, summon your own higher energies. It's kind of an armor of goodwill, an armor of um, divine, divine order, and just protect yourself that way. So you can create, a, create a wall, create a kind of a shell around you that keeps them from entering your energy. And there are various ways you put up the shield, but the basic shield is your own conviction. I'm okay, they aren't. And I don't have to worry about them. But the, you, sometimes people visualize a shield around them. It's like it's one-way glass. I can see out on, on their side, they see their own reflection, a one-way glass that is impermeable, and that, that can protect you. I like that. Yeah. So you talk about, I mean, fear attracts fear, like attracts like. So going into ways to heal, we've talked about that talk therapy, you tend to kind of stew and ruminate in the same energies. That's why a lot of times it's really not that effective. So it's, it's a common misconception that rehashing things and reliving them are, is going to help to purge these emotions, but that's not accurate, is it? Not really. It, sometimes when we view difficult situations, and you want to lead people into eventually, yes, we know that so-and-so doesn't like you, so-and-so has upset you, so-and-so has fed you a inferiority complex, made you afraid to express yourself. And if, if you can say, okay, now we've identified the problem, now what are we going to do? The rest of the talk is, what will we do about this? Right. And uh, how, if you're depressed all the time, then you have to shift the, and the questioning to, what is it going to take to make you feel happy about your life? What is it going to do to, build up your confidence that you're a decent person despite these issues. So you talk about the cure, the solution, instead of the, the issue. Very often in, in psychotherapy, people talk to the depressed part of you or the anxious part of you, and the dialogue is between the therapist and the anxious part of you. And I tell people, well, the, the anxious part of you is very real, but it doesn't have the resources to heal itself. You have to talk to a different part of you one knows in certain situations, I am confident, I'm serene, I enjoy myself, I know I good work, talk to that part of you to try to activate that because that's the part that can heal the depressed part, that's the part that can heal the anxious part. So dialogue on that way becomes proactive and solution-oriented. 
The problem with much of modern psychology is that it's sickness oriented instead of wellness oriented. And there's a big difference. Um, it's the focus. Right. And, and it, it, the, the intent, the intent is not to spend your day analyzing your problems, is to find solutions for them. And so people can, can get uh, stuck in analysis and never get to cure. So, so someone's I've, depressed and they say, Dr. Lightman, what are the steps I should take? Well, it, it, you have to individualize it. I only speak in, in broad strokes of generalities, but in, if someone's very depressed, you need to take time off from analyzing why they're depressed. It's like we, we probably already know enough about how deeply you are depressed and what depresses you and who did it, or who, who added to it. But let's, let's set that aside for a bit. Let's, let's ask yourself, when and how do you depress yourself? And one of the odd questions is, if I were to imitate you, and I, I would become like you, how, how would I do this? Uh, what, did, what do I think about or focus attention on that depresses me? And um, is this something that um, you feel, something you see? Is it memories you recall? Uh, what is it you have to create in yourself to feel depressed? And I realize, you know, your background may have helped you, but you, you, you have a well-rehearsed act here. You're of, perpetuating it. Yes. You need to tell them, well, then you need to stop that. You need to... <laughs> and the idea is, now, what, when you're happy, and there are some times when you're happy and confident, feel loved, cherished, safe, what triggers that? What sort of situation goes on? What sort of memories do you recall? What do you see? And what do you hear? Uh, and let's work on increasing that. That will help build up a sense of joy or enthusiasm or comfort. And so you start working right away on the solution, right away on the, the cure for the depression. And with the mindfulness that other people victimize us, but we victimize ourselves much more efficiently than anyone else because we run our whole body. We run our memory system. We run our attention. We can choose to focus on something positive or something in the past that's very negative. We're in control of that. And we need, we need to exercise that self-control better in a more skillful way. Yeah. So I sometimes tell people our mind sort of is like, like the radar on small boats, the radar searches back and forth like this. And our psychic radar is sometimes just set to look for threats, to look for enemies, to look for sad episodes. And of course, that turns on a bad mood for us. We have to learn to readjust the psychic uh, radar, <laughs> to look for good things in life, uh, to look for good memories, to look for good signs of something healthy and positive out there. It sounds awfully simplistic, but it's very powerful. It's it simple, works. but yeah. it works. Yeah. And I think that, especially if you've had a challenged childhood, your, your habit is to go negative. Right. So it even takes that much more um, determination and focus in order to kind of flip it. Now you talk about the warehousing, that these are, a lot of these negative emotions we kind of warehouse, and then people can kind of just, you know, kind of get right into them. What does that mean, warehousing in the subconscious, and how do we deal with that? Well, in our life, we, we do store our emotions. Energies can be stored, like electricity can be stored in a battery. And it depends on where we are, but some people go along life, they're very happy and cheerful, and when they run into a difficult patch of life, they sort of draw upon their storehouse of cheerfulness and confidence to get through the rough patch. It's commonly done. Well, it works in reverse, too. Some people accumulate resentment, uh, they accumulate insecurity and fear. Uh, they accumulate uh, remorse and guilt and so on. And so when they come into a situation when they have to respond to this, it may be a healthy situation, party with friends, they won't demonstrate their grief or anger, but they will be less joyful than they would because their emotions have to be swept through this whole reservoir of accumulated sadness or resentment or anxiety. And that's why some people overreact very easily. Uh, right. So it's a grumpy person you talk to, you give them the slightest criticism, it's like, what's the matter? They really have a strong reaction because they have a lot of energy that's at the level of <laughs> resentment and anger and start to get defensive very quickly. Others uh, will reveal their big storehouse of grief. The least little thing, they get depressed. And you have to sort of cheer them up and have a semi-apology because they're overreacting in a way that's really their fault, but you triggered it, so you have to apologize. You have to apologize? Well, not necessarily, but you know, it... We'll go into forgiveness and the gift. That, that's a whole thing. Yeah. But if you have this warehouse of these emotions and layers, how do you get rid of it? 
Well, it's similar to uh, people who adopt a, a dog from a, a, a place that's been abandoned. They take it home, the dog is very afraid. It's been abandoned, it's been beaten and so forth. It takes weeks and weeks of running a lot of love with, to, through the dog to get the dog to calm down, you know, sometimes months. And the same thing applies to our storehouse. If we've had years practicing resentment or anger, or depression or self-pity, it takes more months and sometimes years to uh, flush the energy out by the, the opposite realm, the being actually meditating for periods of time when you focus on for 15 minutes or half hour at a time, being grateful for what my life is, is doing now, grateful for my friends, grateful for my talents, feel really cheerful and enthusiastic about aspects of her life. doesn't mean everything is wonderful and, and deserving gratitude, but there are elements. And uh, if we spend a lot of time um, being positive, really feeling grateful, feeling in, in cheerful, feeling optimistic about my life, uh, and that means uh, probably an hour a day at least to do this, when, we, when you can work it as, it doesn't have to be one chunk, over a period of time that transforms uh, your storehouse of negativity because it's being flushed out by the positive. So the gratitude is really big. They say especially when you first wake up to just try to just put yourself in that state of joy and gratitude to get the day going. And you also mention in your book those positive affirmations do make a difference, right? They do. I sometimes tell people in, in the physical realm, when we get up in the morning, we eventually, in, in certain sequence, we, we bathe, uh, we dress, and we eat. And we need to do the psychological equivalent of that, so that we, we get up and we, we bathe in the light of love and so forth, that I'm back in the world again. <laughs> it's, it, I feel you know, a, the light of God guiding me today. Uh, and you try to feel that as well as think that and develop the conviction of it. And then uh, we get dressed. Uh, we get dressed in terms of, um, I know who I am. I know what my purpose in life is this. I know what my purpose is for the domestic activities and for my career activities. And uh, I, I like people. I meet a lot of people that are disturbed or dysfunctional, but I'm sympathetic to them. I try to be helpful, at least not add to their burden by my criticism. We dress in the right thoughts, dress in the right perspective, dress in the right sense of purpose for the day. Then we eat. And the psychological kind of part of eating is we try to dine on positive thoughts and positive feelings with the notion that um, it's a troubled world, but some of us are here to um, be helpful, to, to make the world a better place. Not out there, not in the Middle East, but at least in my own family, in my own office, in my own community, I have influence and I can make that a positive influence. And it can be I know in certain key areas I can be very helpful. So we, we, we dress in our, um, uh, <laughs> I remember once I showed up someplace and I was in um, a suit and tie and so forth, I was apparently overdressed. And they sort of looked at me and said, I'm in my uniform. I said, what, what do you mean your uniform? Well, <laughs> when I go to church, I put on a shirt and tie and, and a suit and so forth and, and my good shoes. That's my uniform. And they still didn't get it. But our uniform, <laughs> is the, the mental set that goes with the appropriate clothing, et cetera. So that's all a psychological way of dressing and eating and bathing, et cetera, that prepares you for the day. That's that to simple. pay attention to our, our spirit and right. our emotions, which takes me to that you feel, rightfully so, that it's important for us to have an active collaboration with spirit, to have a relationship. Well, very often I have real trouble with how religion is taught. It sometimes leaves a lot of things out. They make too much of faith. They idolize Jesus too much. Uh, faith is important, but it probably but it, it tends to be a passive form of faith. I'm I'm waiting for rescue. I'm waiting for God to kiss me and lift me up. Uh, that's childish. <laughs> it is infantile. What we need is uh, to learn how to cooperate with uh, our spiritual purpose, our spiritual design. We need active collaboration. So when we're feeling down or confused or upset, we need to realize, no, God didn't design me to go through life confused or nervous or discouraged. Uh, there must be something I can do to collaborate more with our, my divine design for an enlightened thinking and being creative. There must be something more I can do to be calm and cheerful and upbeat and optimistic. 
must be something more I can do to, to be appropriate and effective in this project or this job or this relationship. So you have to invoke it. And probably what is stronger than faith is curiosity. I see other people walking around the streets. They're cheerful, they're upbeat, they have great relationships. They enjoy their life. What do they know? I don't know. What, what are they doing I'm not doing? See, it's, it's curiosity that helps attract the right pattern, the right frame of thought. You observe more, you finally find the answers. You're working on solutions and answers. Always with the notion there's always more to learn about anything. There's more to learn about how to do my job, more to learn about staying healthy. There's more to learn about being a better communicator, you know, all the varieties and how to shift and so forth, what to say and, all, and when to shut up and when to listen as part of the communi communication skills that often aren't, aren't taught. <laughs> And so on, but that it's curiosity, including what is my divine design? What does God want me to do here? What have I been designed to do? And very early in that process, you realize, well, God didn't design me to be miserable. God didn't design me to be sick. God designed me to figure out how to fix these things. And if I work with him, work with divine power, more energy will come to this. It's not up to me. I have to ground this stuff, but I need to participate in the process of making this work. That's left out of most modern uh, religion, the notion that we have to participate. And we need a skillful mind to do this, a loving heart, an attentive mind, uh, and a, a, a capacity for a vision that we can move beyond our current situation and to something that's better. So all that encompasses, uh, it starts with curiosity, not passive faith. Uh, I, have, I really am critical of people who say, well, I'm, I'm waiting for God to rescue me. <laughs> and, and, we have to take responsibility. Absolutely. That's what all of this is about. And, and in your books, you talk about the different ways. And in the gift, we're going to talk about the forgiveness and the prayer. But there are ways we have to be actively involved. Sure. This is not a passive. This is not a one-sided relationship. And you say that it's hard for God to um, receive us if we're kind of mired in gunk, right? right. Yes. If we're in these negative kind of toxic energies, the connection is going to be harder. Sometimes impossible. Okay. And that's because he's a higher vibration or because we're not seeing, we're not clear? Well, I talk about we have to get in the right wavelength to appreciate uh, our divine blessings. If we're miserable, uh, afflicted with deep self-pity, uh, unconsolable depression, uh, even our good friends can't get through to us. I mean, they, we, they may talk and say things, they may hug us, they may say lovely things that may radiate their, their charm and their, their kindness to us, we won't feel it because we're down here and they're up here. <clears throat> and it's like, they're inner, it's like they're talking in a different language. Different frequency. Right. So we <clears throat> talked about this last night, but there are some people that are physiologically cannot change it. They have a chemical issue that whether they're bipolar or whatever, there are some people who try to do everything and they can shift. That's one category. But there's a big category of people through the exercises in your book that can shift their whole experience, their vibration, and their, their life. Yeah. And there are ways to do that. Your books have a way of really kind of just tuning in to the ways that we can make excuses and the ways that we can be victims. And so how, how do you know if you're a victim? How do you... <sighs> point out to someone that they're being a victim because it's hard to see when you're in it. Well, there, unfortunately, there are <clears throat> nasty people out there and bad events going on. We, we all are victimized to some degree by other people who either deliberately nasty or they're just naturally nasty and they don't even realize how they're doing harm to us. It, has, it just happens. But <clears throat> the big thing is um, when we victimize ourselves that somehow people wear us down and we're convinced, well, we really aren't very effective, or we really don't know how to handle this very well. We're a very marginal person, minimal skills, mediocre lifestyle. We get convinced we're dragged down by them. And sometimes they're, we're dragged down because there are some people who are very petty, and they're, they're very threatened by people who are smarter than they are. They're very threatened by people who are cheerful when they can't be. And you sometimes see that within families. You see father being jealous of the son, the mother being jealous of the... What is that? Is that a karmic thing? Like, why would a father have that? Like it's just the dark side of human nature, I think. 
people often are very self-absorbed. They think of themselves all the time, and and they, they they really they know they aren't doing very well, and they they're envious of people who are happy and cheerful and successful and younger and stronger than they are. And it just comes out. It's just the dark side of human it's nature. It's tragic within a family that yes. a parent could feel that way about a child. It's pretty common. <laughs> it is common. And the, the kids often realize, you know, <clears throat> mother or dad, they don't know what they're doing. And they just sort of learn to ignore it. They, they play the role of the good little boy, good little girl, so they're safe until they can escape the house and grow up and get out of there. But <clears throat> that's much of the real victimization. As an adult, you can recognize other people are putting you down. Other people are suppressing you. Other people are ignoring you. It always is a passive aggressive type of, uh, viol of victimization. They don't tell you things. Um, they don't, they're f free with the criticism. They rarely give praise. They rarely um, uh, get excited when you have a success. They, they rarely would uh, say, yes, good job, good job. They, they withhold approval, they withhold praise. That's where a lot of victimization occurs. And Very subtle. Yeah. And, and very well, the message subtle. is very strong. I don't care about you. you know. Right. And even people that appear to be so, you know, nice and you leave them. We talked about this and you're exhausted. There is, you, it's like an, I mean, it's a term. It's energy vampire that exists, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so if this keeps happen, happening, I love your exercise, which is that if you're very charged in an <laughs> interaction with someone, go back and revisit it. And if the same charge is there, it's most likely your trigger. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if it's not, that means that you're being charged by that person. I think the most difficult thing is for us to figure out what is them and what is us, and then how do we begin to remedy it? You know, sometimes you can't run away from if, let's say, someone that you're working with is vandalizing you, you have to protect yourself, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And the ways to protect yourself are the ways we discussed, which is but becoming aware. It's uh, positive affirmations, it's surrounding yourself in a cloak of that, a mirror where things are bouncing back. Any, what else? You have to cultivate excellent coping skills. Uh, and the big thing there is if we start to be uh, very annoyed at people because we, we sense they're deliberately trying to upset us or provoke us, we have to be aware that uh, they are being provocative and we must not respond to that because if we do whole things will get much worse. So How do you not respond when someone's being really provocative? You have to uh, rehearse your, your coping skills. You have to really uh, be very mindful. If they're putting me on and they want me to start to argue with them, they, want, they, right. they, they have a turf battle going on in the office and they want to provoke a fight, uh, you, have to, you have to be three steps ahead of them, realize that's their motivation. They don't want resolution of conflict. They want me to blow up at them so they can justify their anger to me and justify the fact I am their enemy. So we, we, they try to get us to, to express a side of ourselves that they can legitimately hate and re reject. You have to realize that's their game. It's the game they're playing, and that's the appropriate term. The game they're playing is to provoke you, make you embarrass yourself, make you say something you'll regret. Uh, so you got something on them, and you have to realize we're not going to play that game. We're not going to argue with you. Uh, you know, let's let's just try to get along here. And then, if you want to say, well, we can't discuss this now, but let's let's talk. You know, later on this afternoon, we have some free time to sit down, and we can talk about what you need or what it is you think needs to be changed here. And let let's go at it as as adult to adult here. So one one can put things off like that, but you have to quickly realize um, they're out to, mis to create mischief, and I don't play that game. And very commonly it is they want you to um, be angry. They want you to be, uh, reveal how nasty you are. Right. And so this is where, yeah, they, they, they throw the psychic rock at you first, and the verbal rock, and they want you to throw one back so they can, they can really escalate things and improve themselves and prove yourself. You are my enemy, you don't like me, so you really, really resent me, it's your problem. <laughs> and if you happen to have a little reservoir of any of these feelings and you get triggered, then it's going to be that psychic ping pong, right. which is just going to bring you down. Yeah. So it's, we are living in this world. If we start to look at ourselves as these energy beings, that we are a body that's housing our soul, um, everything starts to look very different. And then we really need to take responsibility for 
for everything, which now takes me into your book about the third commandment um, and going into Jesus, which, you know, Jesus consciousness, which has been so misinterpreted, as we've said, is that carrying the cross, can you talk about that? Well, the third commandment is, is that we should explain it. That's where Jesus says, um, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And denying yourself is thought for some people to be um, complete denial of your personality, destroy your ego, become just the, the clay vessel that's filled with God. Now, denying yourself means deny your, your pettiness, deny your, the dark side of your human nature, deny your selfishness, your resentments, your uh, ang petty anxieties. You know, let's turn that off. Let's, let's try to raise up the level of our humanity. Let's try to mobilize the best of our humanity, the best of our kindness and insight and so forth. But taking up your cross is not, <clears throat> it's not to drag your sin around and, and <laughs> make yourself miserable talking about that. It means taking up your responsibilities, taking up your duties. And what, what God wants is not you to confess your sins 12 hours a day. God wants you to be a good human being. It might be a good mother, a good wife, a good husband, a good parent, uh, a good executive, a good clerk, a good doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever it is. To be good at that, meaning being competent, helpful, and, and creative, um, kind, productive, and so forth. So the cross particularly involves where you have a, car, a tendency to be oh, anxious, a tendency to be prone to guilt, tendency to be fail to assert yourself, you let people walk over you. Uh, your cross might be a hot temper, your cross might be you have panic attacks, or the equivalent of panic attacks. That's the cross to bear. Cross to bear means how with integrity and consciousness do you handle your cross to yeah. bear? You do your duty. You do your duty. And how important is service? That is service, I guess, to yourself and to others. Well, uh, people often yak about faith, 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 that all you need is faith, all you need is belief. Makes me want to throw up. <laughs> so I, I never could get that across. I find that we, we understand, I think faith is important. You're right, faith is very important. But you know, the only measure of your faith that really counts is how you respond to life events around you. How do you respond to uh, the quality of your relationships with your family and coworkers? How do you um, deal with the hardships that are thrown in your direction? Uh, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. It's the rubber hits the, uh, the rubber never has, it spins around in the air. It's, oh, I believe, I believe this, I believe in God, I believe in beauty, I believe in joy. Well, wonderful. But well, what are you going to do with this? And you, you have, this has to be applied somewhere. And how you apply your humanity and your kindness and your creativity in your daily conduct is the only real measure of faith. Daily conduct and now, conscientiousness, is, right. is that's really the key. And as Norm says, God doesn't make junk, so it doesn't matter what we're doing. We don't have to be doing something that is labeled as, you know, uh, we don't have to be famous or we don't, we just need to be whatever we're doing to, doing, to do it with that responsibility and consciousness. Sure. So even the most mundane occupations, one can, um, do it with graciousness and awareness that somehow the divine is participating even in my mediocre work here. And um, it's called practicing the presence. Yeah. Right, but we don't have to put up with abuse or no. we just need to no. have discernment while we're practicing being conscious right. and responsible.